So all the fine tuning of the universe is something that has come to fore in the last, I don't know, a couple of decades where a lot of people are focusing on it, uh, not just physicists, but philosophers, even theologians. Everybody's weighing in on this. As an observational cosmologist, how do you view this so-called fine tuning? Well, a good example of something that feels like fine tuning showed up in this uh, surprising result that we found uh, that came out of the fact that we were seeing a universe that was expanding faster and faster. Um, the explanations that people are trying out often have to do with an energy uh, that you spread throughout empty space. Um, we call it dark energy. And the amount of that energy seems to be a, um, a fine-tuning problem because it's a part in 10 to the 120 of what you might have naively predicted if you had just tried to do the calculations from basic quantum mechanics. So you know, why do you get something that's tuned down to a part in and if it were much bigger than that? Then you would end up with a universe that would expand so fast that you would never, never form get... any structure. We wouldn't be here. There would be none of the, of the interesting stuff in the universe. It would just be sort of an empty, uh, yeah, empty soup right, of particles. Right. And if it was much smaller than that? Or... Well, then you would, uh, you would have had a universe um, that was slowing um, uh, and not speeding up as we see. Right. Um, so so uh, there was a, a classic example of a fine tuning. Similarly, um, there's the problem that the... Well, another related thing was the fact that the current energy in, this, in, this, uh, in the vacuum, uh, this dark energy that's causing the acceleration, um, is within maybe a factor of two of the amount of energy density um, that's equivalent in mass in the universe. From Einstein's E equals mc squared, we know that energy and mass have an equivalence. And so you can just compare how much of one do you have to the other, and they're within a factor of two of each other, the amount of mass and the amount of energy in this. And the amount of mass is the, everything we see, which is the ordinary matter plus all the dark all matter. All the dark matter, you know, anything at all anything, that has gravity right, uh, right, that, you know, that attracts right, that way. Right. And so, um, and you seem to need this kind of balance to have the kind of universe that we're in, where, where you can have enough structure and enough time for that exactly. structure to exist so that life can evolve. Precisely. And so you might so ask, well, I'm very why? happy about that. Right, right. I mean, it happens to, you know, it works well for us. You know, yeah. it's, but, but why um, do you have these numbers that are, you know, that are really either tightly fine tuned to part in 10 to 20, or, you know, in the case of the uh, energy densities, you know, one energy has been falling dramatically because as the universe expands big, you know, by vast amounts, the mass in the universe gets diluted. So its energy density is dropping. It's just becoming more and more diluted. Of the, of the mass. Of ordinary mass in the universe. And, and plus dark matter included within that. Exactly. And, and what, whereas the, the energy density... Of the vacuum, yeah. right, the, this dark energy goes, goes with the vacuum, so it stays constant. So why is it that one... Because as space expands, the, the, the energy you of... You get more of that energy. You get more of the same thing. Precisely. In every given cubic meter or whatever of, 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 of space, it's the same thing. Exactly. And you get more, it's just more of it. So why should one of them that's been just falling by, by orders of magnitude has been dropping and dropping happen today to be with a factor of two of the other? Seems a little bit magical. You know, why, why, why would that be the case? Now, there are a couple of angles on this. I mean, one is that from the point of view of the scientists and the physicists, it's, we, tr we usually treat anything like this, anytime you see a, uh, a what looks like a surprising fine-tuning as a clue. You say, that must be suggestive of some structure in our theory that we've missed. And maybe if we really, really get our physics theory correct, suddenly this will just drop out. We'll say, oh, of course, this has to happen. Um, in, uh, you, know, you have to get the energy density of dark energy, the vacuum, to be a part in 10 to the 120 of what you would have expected. It's because, and then you have a, a new explanation that is because you now understand physics better. And that's in some sense, the thing it that drives you to look for that. Right, right. It's, it's what you hope for most, that, that this is exactly the kind of clue that, that keys you in on a part of the theory that you had missed before. And that once you understand that, suddenly it all makes sense. And, and therefore, if you achieve that, it is not fine-tuning, but it's the natural consequence. Precisely. In fact, it is the only, it's a necessary consequence of, of whatever the fundamental exactly, theory exactly. would be. And so that's what you would love to find. And that would leave you feeling like you'd feel very satisfied then because now um, you hope that whatever the new element is of the physics explains not only that part in 10 to 120, but maybe it'll also explain, yeah. oh, I know how you put gravity together with the other forces. We haven't yet come up with our grand unified theory of the universe right, yet. Right. Um, if it explains a few things, you'll feel, aha, this all makes sense. 
I don't have that fine tuning anymore. It's just the consequence of some understanding of, of uh, especially physics. if those different things are, are are sufficiently independent from each other that you're explaining different precisely, kinds of things. Precisely, and otherwise you wouldn't accept it. I mean, if all it did was explain this one thing, yeah. you thought, well, that was, it was you just designed it to explain this. Right, right. But if it explains a bunch of things all at the same time, so now um, you only have to uh, understand your theory in a little bit more um, completeness, and then suddenly lots of things make sense then you feel like you're on the right track. I, th I think the issue, I, I think that's terrific, and I think that is certainly the goal of physics, and it, is the, it, it, it has happened before, and exactly. uh, it is something that is, is certainly everyone's goal. The, the issue that's fascinating to me is that, is that we're, we're, we're at a situation where many of your colleagues are now saying, you know, I don't think we're going to get there. Right. Right. And, and, and these are not, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, college kids saying this. These are very sophisticated people saying, I don't think we're going to get there this time, yeah. and therefore I've got to come up with, with something else. Exactly. And so that's the alternative, right? It could be that eventually you reach the limit of being able to make that beautiful theory suddenly explain everything. And then you'll be left over with some of these fine tunings um, of, this, of the kind we're talking about. What do you make of that? And one direction, of course, that people are trying out right now is they're saying, well, if that turns out to be the case, maybe what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to postulate, oh, that you know, this is the only kind of universe that intelligent life forms can live in, and therefore, um, it's a, this is called the anthropic explanation, and therefore, um, the fact that we see this fine-tuning is just a reflection of the fact that we're here to see it, um, and that it doesn't mean much more than that. Um, others uh, you know, might come to a, a, use this as a way of arguing that there must be myriad universes out there, and of all those myriad universes, there's something that either encourages this kind of universe to exist, and if they can explain that, then they've, they've been able to predict that fine-tuning, or um, that there's a, uh, of those myriad universes, only a certain fraction of them have observers in it, like But us. if you have myriad or infinite, you have plenty of room for, uh, for the extravagance to do lots of things, so that at this least, be, at least one be. or whatever, the exactly. one we're in, could, could, could naturally... Have this, uh, this, right. this odd fine-tuning. Now, Personally, for, for me, um, I, I sort of don't want to throw the towel in yet. I, I sort of feel like, in some sense, uh, some of these, these explanations are still trying to do the science that I'm describing, where you could actually predict um, where, that, where that comes from. But others are, in some sense, giving up, and they're saying, you know, we're not going to be able to come up with an explanation, and the best we can do is say, this is the only kind of world we could live in. I think that, that is possible, but in some sense, that feels to me like you, you should do that at the end of the game after you've tried lots of other things, after you've, in fact, tried to make more measurements that might give you hints as to what's going on. Yeah, they, they would say that, look, they're working as hard as, as you, and you're, everybody's working as hard, but some of them are reflecting and trying to be as honest as they can and say, as they're of saying, now they can't saying, explain. And yes. saying, well, they're saying more than that. They're saying, as of now, we can't explain it, but you know, I, I, I think as, as far as ever, we're, we're, not never going to, we're never going to be able to get there, than and maybe yes. it's something like the planetary orbits, that we're never going to get the perfect cycles, that everything works perfectly, and yep. the perfect uh, epicycles and epicycles, and it, we can design it. Maybe it's just that's the way it is. That's right, that's right. And of course, that's perfectly possible. And in fact, you know, there's no way for us to tell whether that's more likely than the other scenario. The only thing I would say, though, is there's something about the way we've made progress in science in the last what, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, which still makes me feel like we, we shouldn't jump too quickly to a, uh, to a point where we're saying we, we won't get further than this. Um, I would say that we're still finding surprises, that the fact that we can make a measurement... You found one of the biggest yourself with the accelerating expansion. It was just a few years expansion. ago, exactly. Yeah. And so I would say let's wait until we've used all the new technologies we're developing and the ones that we will, we will be developing over the next, you know, century maybe, um, and be making measurement after measurement after measurement if we find that a whole series of measurements in a row, none of them have any new surprises and help give us clues for what to look for, then maybe you start to ask, okay, maybe we finished this, you know, we've, we've gone as far as we can go, let's step back and say, well, maybe we have to stop for a while and that we won't be able to make this next big leap in our understanding. Personally, I'm just an optimist. I just don't see the evidence yet that, uh, that we've reached that point. And uh, the fact that we still made a discovery just you know, a few years ago implies to me that we still need to keep working for a little while and see what other discoveries we find. And if, you know, give us a generation or so, and we, and we haven't gotten anywhere, I don't know, maybe even a few generations, uh, you can't always be lucky and have it be the next measurement you make, then let's start considering these alternatives that um, say, this is just the way the world is. We're not going to come up with a better explanation beyond that. But meanwhile, I, I'm, uh, 
I, I'm still an optimist. I, I still think we have room for maneuver. Okay, I hear three kinds of explanations. One, that there's some ultimate fundamental theory which will explain multiple things, including some of these fine-tuning things. Secondly, that's just the way it is. We're, we're happy to be here. Take it or leave it. Third, multiple universes and anthropic explanations. We have to be here in, the, in that universe which, which we're here. Um, the second one is particularly interesting because it seems to defy credulity. I mean, you're now accepting fine-tuning to 120 decimal places. That, that, that seems not to make any sense. So I'm okay with one and three, but two I have a problem with. I mean, to some extent, right, it's, it's just possible that the world isn't constructed in a way that we like, right? I mean, this, it, to us, it's just not satisfying at all if the world turns out to have bizarre, random, you know, huge, big numbers and tiny little numbers <laughs> stuck in for no reason at all. It just, it just doesn't feel satisfying. But nobody said that they had to design a, a universe for our personal pleasure. Um, so it's possible that that could be the case. Now, on the other hand, I also see... But it's so yeah. difficult to understand that it could be the case and it's fit for life. I mean, it, it's possible that that could have been a universe, but to have that kind of universe so arbitrary with all the numbers and it works for us defies credulity. Well, there's another angle on it, which I think um, might make it seem more plausible, which is that when I say that um, it doesn't make any sense to us, I think it highlights the fact that um, saying it has to make sense to us, the particular kind of mind that we evolve to live in the particular space that we, you know, that we evolved in um, may not be the sort of mind that you would need to understand the full physics of the universe. It's not, uh, there's no guarantee, as I'm saying, that those happen to be the right mental tools that you need. Maybe we needed to be able to hold, instead of you know, seven ideas in our brain all at one time, we need to be able to hold 4,662 you know, um, ideas in our brain all at the same time in order to really get how the, how the physics of the universe works. And if we were able to do that, maybe it would turn out that, ah, at that point we'd say, it's a beautifully simple, elegant physics, and it does explain all those little points, and they aren't fine-tuned. So what you're saying is that your category two, if we had the capability to understand, would then be devolve into category one. Exactly. And so I'm saying that there's, there's one way in which the category two doesn't seem quite as arbitrary and as, you know, it can't be that way, <laughs> as, you know, as I think we, we tend to feel. And that's just because um, I, I think we tend to look at it through the blinkers of our particular brain structure and how it is that we understand logical connections. And that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that there's, uh, there isn't a perfectly good logic about how the, the universe world works that, um, you know, and we, and, and we can't see it. Uh, I mean, no, it still would be a logical system. It's just that we wouldn't be able to see it if our brains are not up to that job.